Well, since Boris Badenov pushed them into a clock tower and wrecked the controls, time is really flying for Rocky and Bullwinkle. And when Bullwinkle tried to break through the door, he bounced right into the whirling machinery. Bullwinkle, where are you? I'm right down here at about half past two. I want to fly down and get some help. And the plucky squirrel eased himself out through a small window in the face of the clock and leaped into space. And just in time, too. Down and down he streaked, then shot right through the window of the conference room of the World Economic Council. The clock! The clock is out of control! The members ran to the window and looked out. Sure enough, the enormous clock was acting in a most peculiar way. Oh, this is terrible. You said it, Mr. Blurt. Bullwinkle's inside that thing. No, you don't understand. That's the biggest clock in the city. The whole town regulates its time by our clock. Things must be awful down there. Fiduciary Blurt was quite right, for even though the huge clock hand swung wildly, people still tried to regulate their lives by its time. Good morning, dear. Leaving for work? You out of your mind, Mabel? I just got home. Hurry, Walter. You'll be late for school. But it's the middle of the night, Mom. The lawn needs mowing, Woodrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Don't be silly, Woodrow. Tomorrow was over yesterday. Meanwhile, Rocky and Fiduciary Blurt had rushed to the clock tower. We got to break down the door. Here, let's use this fire axe. Hello, me young man. It's Hemlock Soames, the chief security officer. Stand back, please. You shouldn't get hit by splinters. Da, 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 da. Hurry, my pal! Of course, little fellow. But as Burroughs swung the axe back, he let go of it and it flew out the window. Oh, I'm such a bother, fingers. Now we'll never get into the clock tower. Meanwhile, Bullwinkle had succeeded in climbing to a small platform just above the whirling machinery. Boy, safe at last. Little did Bullwinkle know that he was standing right next to the clock's chimes, and as the hand moved to 15 after, a huge hammer drew back, ready to strike the quarter hour with Bullwinkle's head as its target. Meanwhile, Rocky was searching for something with which to smash the tower door open. Hey, there. What you doing in my broom closet? I'm looking for something to open the tower door with. By ye mini, you're in luck, little feller. I got a special thing yours for that. An axe? No. A battering ram? No. A sledgehammer? No. What is it? Well, I call it a key. A key? Well, let me have it. And Rocky dashed off with the key to the tower. Unfortunately for the janitor, the keychain was still fastened to his belt. Oh, he's a cute little squirrel. <laughs> this must be the wrong key. It's open. Thanks a lot, mister. That's okay. Just get his license number. Bullwinkle? Yeah, Rock. Ooh. The huge hammer missed Bullwinkle's head by a whisker. But the vibration that followed knocked him off his platform and out of the window in the clock face. He's gone. Let me look. Oh, poor fellow. Gee, Mr. Song, is he... Don't look. You wouldn't like it. Boris, he's really gone? I hate to say this, Natasha, but no. Sure enough, Bullwinkle was at that moment hanging by his fingertips from the hand of the clock, which showed 20 minutes after four. So what we do now? <laughs> we just wait till half past. Don't miss our next episode, Crime on My Hands or Hickory Dickory Drop. another scrap with the creases boy, eh, Junior? Yeah, Pop. Well, don't look so glum. We all have to lose sometime. Oh, I didn't lose, Pop. Butch Creases came out of it with two black eyes, while I only got one. Yes, but I'm sure neither of his can match the grandeur of yours. I smell a mortal coming up. And it's a dilly. Quality is more important than quantity. I can almost see what you mean. And as a further illustration of that adage, let us take the fable of the hare and the hound. Once there was a hound who, while walking through the forest, came across a bear trap. If I was to stick my leg into that trap and some dumb animal came along and thought I was hurt, he would take me into his home and nurse me and feed me. 
Having everything to gain and just a leg to lose, the hound put his worst foot forward and... Ooh! That's smart. The first animal to come along was a hare. Hello, hound. Hello, hare. What you doing? I ain't waiting for no streetcar. You got your foot caught in a trap, haven't you? Yeah, and does it hurt? Does it? Now that you ask me, yes. Look, why don't you be a generous hare and take me home with you? Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do that. But I will help you get out of the trap. Being an unusually bright hare, he took the hound to the edge of the nearest cliff. And what are you going to do? I'm going to toss the trap over the cliff. I know, but where it goes, I go. But you want to break the trap, don't you? The hare's plan worked to perfection. The trap was broken. So was the hound's leg. The hare was forced to take him home. Look, look here, Rover. I can only let you stay one night. Oh, but that would be inhumane. Please, Hare. You gotta let me recoup. You let me stay here until my leg heals, and someday I'll do you a favor. Honest engine. Scout's honor. The Hare agreed, and for six months he waited on the hound hand and foot. The day before the cast was to be removed, a stranger came to the door. There's a rumor going around that you got a dog. Well, that's right, but... Uh, you got a license for that dog? Well, you see, he's not really my... You're under arrest. But, but, but... Don't you worry, Harry. Someday I'll do you a favor. Honest, honor. Scout's engine. The little hare was sentenced to the rock pile for 30 days. Of course, things could have been worse. For instance, on Sundays, he was allowed visitors. Tough break, hare, but don't you worry. I'm taking care of your house. I know, but can't you help me get out of here? Hire a lawyer. Oh, that costs money. Well, I've got money. It's hidden under the... Rug? Sorry, hair. I found that weeks ago, and the dog's got to eat, you know. <laughs> now, that word dog was overheard by a guard. Say, whose dog are you? Why, I'm, uh, I'm his. Well, you ain't got no license. Sure enough, the hare received another sentence on the rock pile, and this one was for 30 years. By the time I get out of here, I'll be an old gray hare. Not if the hound could help it. Psst. You. I told you someday I would do you a favor. Look, do me a favor. Don't do me a favor. Don't be silly. I'm going to help you crack out of this place. Jamming a basket full of eggs under his arm, the hound led the hare to the front gate. Just a second there. Where do you think you're going? Open the gate, open the gate. This is the Easter Bunny, and he's gonna deliver some eggs. Oh, yeah. Let me look at those eggs. These must be hard-boiled eggs. Mm. Actually, they were hard-boiled hand grenades. I couldn't find any eggs. The hare received an additional 30 years, one for trying to escape, and 29 for impersonating the Easter Bunny. But the day finally came when he was released. Old and bent, he headed back to his forest home. And wouldn't you know he'd come across his old friend, the hound? Ooh, that's smart. Hello, hound. Foot caught in a trap again. Yes, yes. You say, I wonder if you'd mind, you know, taking me home and caring for me. Well, I, I'd like to, but I've got a friend staying at my place. He's been taking care of things for me during the past ten years. Did you say friend? One friend? One friend is all I got. Then let's be on our way. One friend ain't gonna bother me. Yes, it looked as though the hound would continue taking advantage of the good-hearted hare. Ah, but that's where friendship came in. For even though the hare had but one friend... Let me out of here! That friend was an important one. Hello, hare. Hello, skunk. So, you see, son, quality is more important than quantity. I got a moral, too, Pop. Good things come in smell packages. <laughs> That's hitting it on the nose. And now, here for all you men of letters, is Mr. Know-It-All. Hello, mailman. Today's dissertation is subtitled, How to Escape from Devil's Island and Get Away from It All. Supposing you were incarcerated on Devil's Island, and supposing further still you had served 10 years out of your 30-day sentence, you would want out, and this is how you would do it. 
first you will put on your bathing suit, then walk out of your cell and go directly to the warden, who is standing on the edge of a high cliff. Good morning, one, two, three, four, five. Good morning to you, merciless jailkeeper. For my recreation period today, I am going to swim to the mainland. Having completely pulled the wool over his eyeballs, you make the leap, and you roll your way out. <coughs> Fortunately, so is the tide. After returning to Devil's Island, they put you where they put all the incorrigibles. In the kitchen. You going to peel potatoes till they're coming out of your ears? This should give you a idea. Putting a potato in each ear, you jump into a sack and await shipment to a foreign port. Of course, there is always the danger they are having potato soup for dinner. Whoever peeled these spuds did crummy job. I'm doing the best I can. And that is how you escape from Devil's Island. But, Mr. Noodle, you didn't get out. I most certainly did, by joining the baseball team. And that's how you escaped. Sure. Three strikes, and you're out. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... Meet my... Ooh. Now for another of our special features. Should have tried E flat. Hello out there, Peabody and Sherman here. Any idea where Churchill Downs is, Sherman? Sure, Mr. Peabody. It's in Kentucky. Mm, right, boy. And that's our target for today. Set the Wayback Machine for the year 1875. You'll be on hand for the first running of the Kentucky Derby. The Wayback whisked us through time and space directly to the stable area where the horses were being readied for the classic race. I got him! I got the sneaking Yankee varmint! Golly, Mr. Peabody, somebody's been shot. Yes, and he'll never bite my horse again. Somebody bit your horse? That's right. Big one, ain't he? Oh, it's only a fly. No ordinary fly, Sherman. This is a tsetse fly, an African species whose victims fall prey to sleeping sickness. Good thing I got him, then. By the way, I'm Colonel Beauregard, and that's my horse, Alert. Anyone could see that Alert was far from living up to her name. That's funny. She never sleeps before a race. Wake up, girl. We got some running to do. But try as he might, the Colonel couldn't rouse the sleeping steed. Look, Mr. Peabody, she's been bitten. Fearing the worst, Colonel Beauregard called in a horse doctor. That's my diagnosis, Colonel. Alert here's got an acute case of sleeping sickness. But she can't have. The derby's gonna start any minute. Not with your horse in it. Tough luck, Colonel. Oh, I'm ruined. I wagered the old plantation on this race. Don't give up, Colonel. Mr. Peabody will think of something. And moments later, a semi-aroused alert stood with her competitors at the starting line. How'd you do it? How'd you get her to even walk? This bottle of glue. A horse will do anything to keep from going to a glue factory. Merely inhaling this bottle should keep alert alert. <laughs> Hot dog, we're gonna win after all. The colonel's optimism was premature, for just then, Alert's jockey entered the scene. Hello, colonel! Shorty. Shorty? What happened to you, boy? I grew, colonel. This morning, I was three foot seven. Now, I'm seven foot three. I guess it was them vitamins what done it. Vitamins? Who give them to you? The horse doctor. Uh, it would seem as though that... Horse doctor doesn't want your horse to run. Yes, but why? What else does he do besides doctor horses? He runs them. Oh? Yeah, he owns the favorite in the race. Sherman, how do you sit a hobby horse? I haven't been thrown yet, Mr. Peabody. Hmm, good boy. Now take this glue, and whenever alert falters, give her a short inhalation. Thus, at post time, there were two contenders for the run for the roses. The race was on, with alert running a close second. Unfortunately, upon rounding the first turn, a billboard advertising sleeping pills caught her eye and... The glue, Sherman! The glue! <coughs> Thoroughly aroused, Colonel Beauregard's valiant charger overtook and passed her adversary. I'll fix that, horse. 
lullaby and good night. Da da dee da 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 da. Sherman rose to the occasion and quickly applied the bottle of glue. That's when Fagin passed and brought his blow dart talons to the fore. Without the glue, it appeared as though Alert would finish the race next year. I'm through. My horse has had it. Not yet, she hasn't. With a brush and a large bottle of ink, I hurriedly painted a sign. Alert, at peace with the world near the far turn, took one look through half-opened eyes and... She won! My horse went and won! The horse doctor and Fagin were found guilty of selling vitamines without a license and were compelled to clean up the track. As for Colonel Beauregard, he and Alert accepted the plaudits for a well-deserved victory. Smile for the cameras, honey. You did it again, Mr. Peabody. Don't I always, Sherman? By the way, in winning the Derby, I also gave Kentucky something to be proud of. You did? Yes. In painting the sign, I happened to spill the bottle of blue ink all over the green grass. But somehow I think Kentucky will be proud of it. Blue grass of Kentucky. I like that. Well, last time, you remember, we were, um, uh, where were we last time? Oh, come on now. This is Fiduciary Blurt, chairman of the World Economic Council. Yes, and we are horrified because somebody is counterfeiting box tops, the basis of the world's economy. And Bullwinkle and I have been hired to find the counterfeiters. We're being helped by Mr. Blurt's chief security officer. Allow me to introduce myself. Hemlock Soames, and this is my assistant, Dr. Watkins. Pee pee, Paul Bean. But you two are really. Ta -ta, don't be blabbermouth, you blabbermouth. And meanwhile, I, Bullwinkle Moose, am dangling by my pinky tips from this here clock hand. Got the picture now? I've got it. Okay, let's go. Has Moose dropped off yet, darling? No, he's only 26 after, but at half past. True enough, as the clock hand approached the half hour, Bullwinkle slipped nearer and nearer the end of it. Nearer and nearer the end of me, too. And unfortunately for Bullwinkle, Rocky thought he had already fallen. Poor Bullwinkle. How can I carry on? Oh, don't feel bad, Rock. I can't help it. You were my best friend. Yeah, I was, wasn't I? Bullwinkle, is it really you? You got any other buddies with antlers? What are you doing out there? Just hanging around. What time you got, Rock? About 4.29 and a half. Why? Because at 4.30, I got an appointment to fall off this here clock. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle. We got to get you in here. I sort of hoped you'd think of that. Here, let me grab your feet. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> I got ticklish hooks. But at that moment, the huge clock hand moved another minute. Hmm. 4.30. Well, I must be going. And Bullwinkle's hands lost their grip. Fortunately, our boy Rocky was able to pull his feet under the window so that he wound up hanging by his knees hundreds of feet above the ground. Give me your hand, Bullwinkle. I'll, I'll try to pull you in. Hurry, Rock. The blood is rushing through my antlers. It's no use, Bullwinkle. You weigh too much. Yeah, I shouldn't have eaten such a heavy lunch. Well, hang on. Bullwinkle, somebody's bound to notice you sooner or later. Sure enough, at that moment, Bullwinkle was being observed from the park across the street. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Edward. What's that, Chauncey? A moose hanging out of a casement window. Oh, I don't know, Chauncey. Casement windows are getting pretty popular. Fortunately, at that moment, the chairman of the World Economic Council, Fiduciary Blurt, happened to glance out of his window. Oh, goodness, goodness. Please, there is a lady present. That moose fella is still hanging out there. Hmm. He's past 430. He's late. Mr. Soames, you must save him. Who, me? What can you do? Easy. I get rope like this, make noose like this, and lasso moose with noose like that. 
Thanks a thousand, Mr. Soames. Gee, I guess I was wrong, Bullwinkle, not trusting him. Well done, Soames. Elementary, my dear Watkins. And I only forgot one thing. What was that? I didn't face another end of lesu. And sure enough, when Bullwinkle reached the end of his rope, he kept right on going. Don't miss our next exciting episode, Down to Earth or the Bullwinkle Bounce. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> See you next.